The Ottoman Empire survived for 600 years as the preeminent Islamic power. It once ruled a region stretching from Hungary to Somalia, and from Algeria to Iraq. It survived until a little more than a hundred years ago, and actually coexisted with the Warner Brothers Film Company. However, what if this once august state never fell and existed to the present? How would it affect borders, culture, wars, demographics, and the rest of history? That is the question of this alternate history. The Middle East is very complicated. To say anything else would be foolish. To be a political leader there, you have to play four-dimensional chess, and it's easy to make mistakes and oversights or decisions that in the long run are regretted. I was just watching an interesting documentary called Promises and Betrayal about how the British tore up the Ottoman Empire after World War I, offering very different deals to the Arabs and Jews while taking the land themselves, setting up a lot of the conflicts that still exist today. I was able to watch this on Magellan TV, a documentary streaming service home to the richest and most varied history content anywhere. They have stuff on the Middle East, current events, ancient history, and the world wars. It's compatible with basically any device and also comes in 4K without additional cost. Start learning about whatever inspires you on Magellan TV today. Click on the link in the description and get a one month free trial. This timeline is pretty easy to start. The Turks simply choose to not get involved in the First World War, which was the war that resulted in their destruction and the partition of the empire by the Europeans. The Ottoman Empire was a relatively pro-German state, but also had British sympathies. The pro-British faction was crushed by Britain requisitioning two ships the Turks had ordered from British manufacturers for their own war effort. The Ottoman Minister of War, Enver Pasha, was pro-German and organized a deal with the Germans, in which the Germans gave them two ships, the Goeben and Breslau, from their Mediterranean fleet, to which the Turks opened the Dardanelles Straits to bombard the Russians in the Black Sea. After this, they reverted Turkish control. This dragged the Turks into the war. This never occurs in this timeline, and the rest of the Turkish government denies the German passage to the Dardanelles and steers clear of the war. Many powers try to court Turkey to their side, but the Turks stay neutral. The Turks were a net gain for the central powers in our timeline, tying down the Allied forces in Gallipoli, Palestine, the Caucasus, and Mesopotamia. And since the central powers still lost in our timeline, they would still lose in this world. The Turks would be in an excellent situation with the collapse of Central Russian Authority in 1918. They would invade the Caucasus in an effort to seize Azerbaijan and unite with their Turkic brothers. With Russian Authority painfully weak due to the Russian Civil War, they would seize the southern slope of the Caucasus and modern nations like Armenia and Azerbaijan. There would be no Armenian Genocide in this timeline, since the Armenian Genocide was caused by fear that the Armenians would side with the Russians in case of a Russian invasion, and with no threat of a Russian invasion, thus the Armenian Genocide would not occur. Greater Armenia would survive alongside other Christian groups that were victimized like the Assyrians. Lots of people think that if the Ottoman Empire didn't fall apart in World War I, it would immediately fall apart afterwards due to internal divisions. I wholeheartedly disagree since A, the Ottomans were going through an incredible process of reforms in this era to modernize and westernize the nation. B, a lot of oil was just discovered in this region, which would make it one of the most valuable areas of the world. C, multi-ethnic empires are the norm in this region of the world. Let me break down each of these claims. In our timeline, World War I vaulted Ataturk from a minor officer in exactly the right place to the supreme commander of the Turkish nation in five years. This was since Ataturk was continually able to demonstrate his incredible abilities on the battlefield. However, in a world where this never occurs, Ataturk would likely still rise to power, just due to sheer raw talent, but it would still take several decades for him to work his way through a peacetime government. In our timeline, Ataturk is famous for making a series of reforms completely transform Turkey, 
transforming it from a more traditional Islamic empire to a more of a modern European-facing nation, which is why Mustafa Kemal was given the name Ataturk, or Father of the Turks. What many people fail to realize is that the political party that ran the Ottoman Empire before Ataturk's seizure of power, the Young Turks, were instituting reforms at an incredible clip. Almost all of Ataturk's ideas were ideas that came from the Young Turks playbook. A big deciding factor is not having the Turkish War of Independence, which was in our timeline after World War I, the Greeks invaded Turkey and made it nearly all the way to Ankara before being wiped out by Ataturk. If the Turkish nation in this timeline would be shook enough to institute the reforms Ataturk did, and without Ataturk's sheer force of personality in the lead, would Turkey have the same reforms as early? I'm guessing that the Young Turks would do a lot of Ataturk's reforms in the 1920s, while Ataturk would probably get into power himself in the 1930s and do a lot of the rest. However, there would be exceptions. Losing World War I and nearly losing the Turkish War of Independence in our timeline made the Turks lose a lot of faith in their own civilization, which allowed parts of Ataturk's reforms. I'm guessing that the reformers, including Ataturk, are no longer able to get rid of the Caliph. This was an enormous move and hugely controversial, the equivalent of getting rid of the Pope in the Catholic world. Similarly, some other overtly pro-Western stuff, like banning the hijab or changing the Turkish language to the Latin alphabet, would never take place. Another very important variable, which, as said before, that the Turks would discover an incredible amount of oil in areas like Saudi Arabia and Iraq. However, some of the wealthiest and tiny Gulf states like the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, and Kuwait were under British control. With this ridiculous amount of oil money, the Turks would have unending funds for modernization. The oil money would provide unending funds which the Turkish regime would plow into industrializing the country. Turkey's industrialization would be several decades earlier in this timeline. In our timeline, the collapse of Ottoman power on the coasts allowed minor chieftain named Abdulaziz ibn Saud was able to seize control of the holy cities of Mecca and Medina and gain control of most of the Arabian Peninsula. The Ottomans outclassed the Arabs by nearly every metric, and without the total collapse of their power, would have been able to maintain control of the Arab Peninsula. In fact, once they realized the Saudis were sitting on a lot of oil, they'd probably wipe them out and seize the region. Thus, there never would be Saudi Arabia in this timeline. This would have a really good effect in the whole region, since the Saudis, with their vast oil revenue, have been able to fund their radical branch of Islam, or Wahhabism. When Westerners think of the worst, most intolerant sections of Islam, ISIS, the Taliban, Al-Qaeda, they are all derived from the Wahhabist tradition, with all those groups receiving Saudi money. With the Ottomans as moderate Muslims, none of this would come to be. A big reason people say the Ottoman Empire could never have survived is due to ethnic divisions. This ignores that the Arab sections of their empire hadn't been ruled by locals since 539 BC in the Babylonian Empire. Meanwhile, all the empires in this region are multi-ethnic, since the ethnic groups are so mixed together. Saying that the Middle East needs to have ethno-states, well, there are successful pluralistic ones like Canada, South Africa, Belgium, or Singapore, is one of the ways it's okay to be racist in our society today, by holding Muslims to much lower standards than the rest of the world. The Turks are hard rulers, and so could have dominated the Arab sections of their empire with a moderate amount of terror. World War II was difficult to figure out in this timeline. You wonder if the Turks would view their neutrality in World War I in a positive or negative light. They might have the prescience and wisdom to realize that they would have lost, but pumped up by industrialization or nationalism, might have delusionally believed they could have won. In the original script of this video, I had the Turks siding with the Axis and seizing Egypt, Sudan, the Middle East, Western Iran, and the Caucasus forming a greater Islamic empire. I decided against this, partially since I realized the Turkish leadership would probably be wise enough to know that they were in an early enough stage of industrialization that they'd be putting themselves in a world of danger in an age of mechanized warfare. Also, they'd be able to make a ridiculous amount of money selling oil to both sides. I don't think Turkey would get invaded either, with the Russians and Germans knowing that the other was their main rival, and then a major war would get them bogged down in the Anatolian or Caucasus mountains, which would leave them vulnerable, while 
most of the Ottoman's oil supply was on the other side of the mountains in the Arab section of the empire. World War II takes a similar direction. The main exception is that in the fall of 1942, rather than go after Stalingrad, which is the way to get to the Azeri oil fields in the Caucasus, which would be under Turkish rather than Russian control in this timeline, the Germans go after Moscow instead. This would likely result in similar results, the Russian winter, sheer space, and the courage of the Red Army creating the same exact thing. World War II would have a similar ending, with the Reds and Anglos dividing Europe down the middle. Industrialization happens on a civilizational and cultural basis. We've had two waves of industrialization so far. In the first, your level of industrialization was determined by how culturally close to Britain you were. In the second, by how close to Japan you were. In my live streams, I say that in 50 to 100 years, I think the Islamic world would be one of the dominant world powers. People say I'm insane, but I say this since Turkey and Iran, to a lesser extent, have industrialized, and so in a couple decades, we should expect something similar in other Muslim countries as they follow those countries' leads. With Turkey industrializing earlier in this timeline, they would also industrialize their colonial empire. The Arabs that would comprise a majority of the empire's population would form cheap labor, and so Turkish factories would relocate to Iraq and Syria once factories in Anatolia had become too expensive. Also, it seems likely that the mercantile peoples of the empire, like the Lebanese, Armenians, and Jews, would benefit disproportionately from this success. Also, with Turkey industrializing earlier, other Muslim regions around the world, like Algeria and Pakistan, would better be able to follow the Turkish model and be in a better position in this timeline. However, there would inevitably be a crisis with the Arab sections of the empire. As modernization would improve, the Arabs would feel stronger connections between each other and seethe under Turkish control. Similarly to our timeline, the Arab section of the empire would fall behind the Turkish section and be poorer, which would also add resentment. However, this region has always been ruled by foreign governments, and so I don't see why the last 70 years should be an exception. The Turks would respond to the Arab discontent with brutal tactics and carrot-and-stick politics, pulling the local leadership into the Turkish fold. At least with industrialization, the massive population growth rate seen in the Arab world in our timeline could be integrated into a developed urban economy that could keep up. The Turks would deal with the multi-ethnic issues of their empire by positioning themselves as the leaders of the Islamic world. They would position themselves as a pan-Islamic empire that happened to be run by the Turks rather than a Turkish colonial empire, although in many ways it still would be. In many ways, the results of this timeline line up very well with Islam's traditional position in history. The Islamic world has been in general dominated by huge empires, with Arabs as a majority, but with some mountain people as the leadership, with Islam as the glue holding the empire together. The Islamic world would likely still be technologically behind the West, but the gap would be smaller and the Islamic world would be catching up much faster. The Turks, positioning themselves as the profoundly conservative arbiters of Islam and terrified of the Soviets and flaming the Arabs, would ally with the Americans after World War II. This would further integrate Turkey into the Western system, and the Turks would further continue their industrialization with Western financing and consulting. Most Arab countries today should not be countries. I don't mean this as a moral judgment, merely a practical one. Countries like Iraq and Libya exist since they were convenient for European governments, while Egypt and Syria before the 1950s hadn't been run by their own native populations for 2,500 years. People give the U.S. a lot of crap for being an imperialist power, but the only reason countries like this, and I'm putting the Africans in this category, exist is it in the global world order created after World War II was based upon the Americans and the U.N., although they had no real power, destroying anyone who would try to conquer their neighbors. Turkey, after passing a certain threshold of power and after the European colonial powers would decolonize, thus leaving Turkey by far the most powerful country in the area, would want to conquer their neighbors, but this was not allowed in the post-World War II global system, and so would instead gain more and more soft power 
inside the Islamic world. Turkish forces would reinstall stability in Somalia, Turkish businessmen would run the Egyptian economy, and Turkish assassins would kill Gaddafi. And if all else failed, they'd still have the Ottoman bomb. On a bizarre side note, Israel is really interesting in this timeline in that after the Holocaust, the creation of the Jewish state would seem absolutely necessary, but with Palestine under Turkish control, that could never take place. An alternative that was proposed that would actually make sense would be the settling of the Jews in the lightly populated highlands of Kenya. This would take place in this timeline, and this would have the strange effect of having the British white settler elite work with the Jews to keep the black Kenyans down. The Jews would become nearly half of the total population of Kenya at this time, and while Kenya, with such a large white population would continue to be a beacon for white immigration from Britain. However, with African population growth rates what they are, there is no way Kenya could remain a majority white state for long, and Kenya would double down as a white supremacist state. The million dollar question is whether the white population would deal with the black one by integrating them into society or becoming harsher with apartheid-like measures. Back in the Middle East, the moderate Sunni Turks would be unable to accept the seizure of power in Iran by radical Shia clerics in the 1970s, thus deplacing the docile pro-Western monarch that came before, and like Saddam Hussein, would invade Iran. However, the Turkish military would almost certainly be miles better than Saddam's, and they would defeat Iran's cannon fodder armies and replace the government in Tehran with a moderate Shia pro-Western one. Iran has immense potential. It is a very very well-educated population with a well-functioning society and a very good geographic position. The second the Ayatollahs lose power in Iran, Iran will become a second-rate power and a few decades later will become an industrial powerhouse. This would happen in this timeline with Iran industrializing like Turkey. Iran would likely remain in their ancestral position of rivals to the Turks and would be allies of whoever was Turkey's enemy. With the fall of the Soviet Union, the Turkic Central Asian Republics would fall into the Ottoman Empire's sway. Their trade would be brought into Turkey's focus through Azerbaijan. These countries would receive Turkish funding and become strong Turkish allies. With such a massive region under its influence, Turkey would verge on being a superpower. We would likely see a conflict in Central Asia between Turkish, Chinese, and to a lesser extent Russian influence, with the Chinese having immense amounts of money and a larger economy than Turkey, but the Turks having stronger cultural affinities. China's control and occupation of their Turkic Uyghur minority would almost certainly turn them into a Turkish enemy. With the Turks in charge, the Middle East would almost certainly be more stable. The region would be industrializing and rising in power. There would be no ISIS, 9-11, Saddam Hussein, Khomeini, or the like. There would never be the massive wave of migrants that washed into Europe with jobs to those people at home and no conflicts. What a faultist, and thank you for watching. If you enjoyed that timeline, please like, comment, subscribe, or stay tuned for more. Or alternatively, check out my Patreon, where I've got the first three chapters of my History of the World, as well as all sorts of cool maps. As always, thank you for watching, and have a great day.